Dr. Madhu, what we are speaking will be heard, huh? Yes, sir. Be conscious. Okay, sir. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning. Can I start, sir? Sir, shall I start? Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, we welcome you to another set of lectures as a part of our Learn from the Master series. Uh, today we have Dr. Madhu Kumar, uh, who is a vitreoretinal consultant at Chankrai Hospital in Guntur, who is going to be sharing insights on intravitreal injections, on the anti vegfs antibiotics, and others. Over to you, Dr. Madhu. Thank you, sir. So, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let us uh, take this opportunity, uh, which we have been locked on because of Corona, to learn and exchange our uh, knowledge. So, the topic which I'm going to talk today is about intraoral injections, uh, anti VEGF, antibiotics, and others. Uh, this is a very vast subject. So, what I have done is uh, um, I'm going to speak uh, about. So this is the overview, what uh, have, uh, I'm going to speak in the coming uh, 45 minutes or so. So instead of uh, going by each drug, the indication studies, uh, which will take each one of its, uh, will take another class. So today I'm going to concentrate on a little bit of introduction, the history, how the intravertical injections evolved. And mainly I'm going to speak on the practical approach where there's a lot of confusion and there is a controversy regarding like what drugs can be used uh, intravitrally. So what are the indications that is very, yes, very, we have a clear cut guidelines, but do we do this procedure in your OPD in your minor OT or an operation theta? So what is the preparation? What the kind of consent we need to uh, take when is there a special consent form we need to take for these things? What are the instruments that are involved? How about the prof uh, antibiotic prophylaxis? Does, do, do, does that have a role or what kind of uh, uh, prophylaxis we use in these uh, procedures? Post-injection, how do we follow up and what are the complications that we need to look for? And uh, I will touch upon the Avastin guidelines because it is, though it is widely used, especially in India, 90% of the VR surgeons, we do use the Bivasis map, but we, are, we need to know that it is an off-label and we need to follow certain guidelines, which is given by the AOS VRSI uh, together. And lastly, about uh, intravital antibiotics. So coming to the history part. So from 1940s itself, there has been anecdotal reports about 
the intravital injections being given, though they were uh, limited to few cases and the animal uh, experiment models. The actual intravital uh, injections era started at nine, by 1980 to 2000, wherein the intravital antibiotics were being given for mainly the endophthalmitis and the CMV retinitis. So it was thought that uh, the need for intravitreal was uh, necessary because the endophthalmitis was very difficult to manage by giving the systemic uh, medications. So during that part, the era of intravitreal injection started. And then came the 2000 to 2004 era where then the steroid tramsulone was being tried and the anti of the phase one and two trials were being uh, carried out. So the actual anti vegf which we are giving now the uh, higher, the increasing number of injections, what we see, it's actually started 2005 and 2006, wherein the ranibizumab was first time approved by uh, FDA for intravital usage. At the same time, in 2005, the off-label usage of bevacizumab was started. The FDA approval was not uh, pushed for bevacizumab because it was already approved for colorectal carcinoma and the off-label usage was approved in the Western countries. So this graph shows how the, the trend changed. From 1993 to 2004, there was slow evolution of intraartal injections. And then if you see the graph here from 2004 to 2016, and now more than 3 million injections are being given. So it is... Uh, According to a few reports, this is the third most common procedure which is being done next only to the cataract surgeries and the yak capsulotomies. So what are the modes of intraocular drug delivery? Why do we uh, need intraocular injections? So the eye drops, the topical application of eye drops is one of the modes wherein the drugs can penetrate through the uh, cornea and then they reach the vitreous uh, vitre cavity, although the concentration of the drug which reduces the vitreous cavity is less. Then we have this lateral plug, we have subconjunctival implants, we have suprachoroidal implants, we have supraslateral injection, we have the intravital implants and the intravital injections. So all these modes of uh, intraocular drug delivery are possible, but why intravital? Of all these things, the intravital injection, the mode of uh, the drug delivery who is most sought after and it is most successful because of certain reasons. One of the main uh, problem in delivering a drug into the uh, vitreous cavity is the blood ocular barrier, which is very strong, which is very efficient, and it protects the eye from the infection or the unnecessary pathologies. At the same time, when needed, it acts as a barrier for the intraocular drug delivery. The other problem is the vitreous being avascular, the drugs uh, which need to enter the vitreous cavity is very difficult because the systemically given drugs may not reach the vitreous in the required min minimal inhibition, uh, inhibitory con concentrations. And uh, not to forget the systemic side effects, the, the dosage which we give for systemic uh, treatment uh, will be for the systemic diseases, but just for the intraocular, uh, uh, the, the target specific drug delivery is much more sought after rather than giving a whole dosage in a systemic way, like either an IM or an IV drug, mm -hmm. which can have the systemic side effects in the other parts. So the advantage of intraocular injections will be the, its ability to maximize the intraocular levels, the uh, target specific drug delivery. It minimizes the toxicities associated with the uh, systemic treatment, and it is tailored to the disease process where we can choose the drug which is needed and deliver the drug where it is needed. So the intraocular injections, there are many drugs which can be uh, delivered into the vitreous cavity, the steroids, the immunosuppressants, the anti-infective, that is antibiotics, the intraocular gases, but the major chunk of it which we uh, we practice, in our practice, we use is anti -VHF. So coming to the uh, the drugs which can be uh, introduced into the vitreous cavity, the presently used intraocular drugs, though pegarnip sodium was the first one which was started, we don't use it now. Uh, Bevacizumab, that is the Avastin, the Ranibizumab and the Aflibacep, and now the Conversept and the Brodicizumab are in the pipeline. 
the anti-infectives, we have antibacterial, antivirals, and antifungals. The steroids, the dexamethasone, trimsilone, the fluosinolone. The immunosuppressants like cyclosporine, methotrexate, the gases like uh, SF6 and uh, C3F8. So a host of these drugs can be uh, given intravitrally. So coming to the uh, topic, which I'm going to stress upon or go in detail, the practical approach. So what is most important uh, in any intravitreal injection is a good pre-injection evaluation. So we need to take a good proper history, which is uh, regarding the duration of the disease or any pre-treatment if the patient has undergone uh, any, more in, uh, many more injections. If, if so, what is that injection so that we know which drug he's responding, whether we need to continue the same drug or we need to switch or change over to the other drug. Then the, uh, the other important aspect is a systemic. One is, does the patient has any systemic foci of infection? If so, first we need to treat that and then take him up for the surgery. Otherwise, he has a higher risk of endophthalmitis. The other most common thing which we usually need to rule out and evaluate is the hypertension. Any patient who has an uncontrolled systemic hypertension is a relative contraindication mm -hmm. for any intravitreal injections. Uncontrolled diabetes, any recent history of a cerebrovascular accident or a myocardial infection, and other systemic drugs if the patient is using and the disease for which he is using, uh, whether it is under control. Because all said and done, the uh, intravitreal injection is a procedure and that causes some amount of stress and that itself can induce uh, the patient, the un untoward uh, in, uh, and, uh, accidents. The other important as aspect is the ocular adnexa. Most of the, uh, of quite a uh, few endophthalmitis following the intravitreal injections is uh, because of the blepharitis or the uh, undiagnosed infection in the ocular adnexa. So it is very important that we evaluate these patients uh, very well and then treat it well before we take up for the intra intravitreal injections. Intraocular pressure is another important factor uh, because uh, I'll touch upon in the subsequent slides. Uh, if the patient is uh, having a higher intraocular pressure, we need to bring it on because the intraocular injection, what we give can uh, give rise to a transient increase in the intraocular pressure and certain eyes which have a lower threshold to tolerate this intraocular pressure can land up in much more trouble. And the other thing is the diagnosis. We need to have a complete diagnosis so that we know what stage that uh, eye is in and what is the treatment we need to give. For example, whether the patient needs a loading dosage followed by a PRN or a treatment extent. Accordingly, we can treat once we have a complete diagnosis. So coming to the important, uh, one more important aspect where there is a controversy regarding where to perform this. Should we give it, do it in a operation theater or in our OPD? So what evidence suggests is uh, it is uh, split. There's no clear cut uh, guideline saying that it has to be done in OT or in an OPD. The Swiss regulation and in Italy, the OT with uh, the operation theater with air filtration system is mandatory. Whereas in uh, UK and Netherlands, the dedicated clean room with uh, mm, uh, the good air quality is enough. Air filtration system may not be mandatory. So what is recommended for uh, our Indian uh, setups is what is given by the AOSVRSI guidelines says we need to do it in operation theater. Uh, it is preferred. <clears throat> And uh, regarding the eye drape and surgical uh, attire, the eye drape and surgical, uh, the gown, what we wear is not mandatory. Uh, if some uh, institution, again, uh, every institution has its own uh, rule, but by and large, uh, these are the guidelines. So you, you need not put the eye drape for the patient, but it is uh, mandatory that the eye is clean properly with the 10% pardon idle and a speculum, clean speculum is placed. Uh, and the injection can be given. The surgeon needs to wear a, uh, the uh, glove and surgical mask after a good hand scrub, and it can administer the injection. So you need not uh, wear an OT gown. So if uh, someone wants to practice the guidelines and uh, the, the, want to give an injection in their, OP, in their OPD or minor OT, this is what 
is need to be done. We need to have an enclosed dedicated clean room, good illumination and washable floor. The ceiling needs to be non-particulate in nature. The restoration facilities needs to be available nearby. And IDO facility uh, is advantageous in some eyes where we need to check for the arterial pulsations. So coming to the uh, choice of anesthesia, uh, usually it is uh, topical, 90, 99% of the cases we use the topical anesthesia, which is uh, in, in the form of drops, the proparacaine, the, the lidocaine uh, can be used. The cotton tip applicators uh, have certain advantages wherein we, when you the injection related conductible bleed and also the pressure uh, receptors are uh, taken care and the patient uh, theoretically will have lesser pain. Uh, Subconductible can be uh, given in certain uh, patients, a different, a different uh, anesthesia techniques for intravertal uh, avastans. It was a topic which was given to one of my uh, DMB students. So we found that the patient uh, pain score was uh, better with these uh, subconductible injection. Uh, the, the eye movements or the patient's pain tolerability was much better, though the, uh, uh, the issue was you have to give two injections, one prick for the subconductive injection and another one for the uh, intravertical injection. Otherwise, uh, all the three were uh, more or less uh, equal. To some extent, statistically, it was mildly significant where, uh, from the patient's point of view, giving the subconductive injections. So coming to the uh, antibiotics, uh, do we need to give... Uh, pre-injection antibiotic for these patients. So what uh, studies suggest is uh, the antibiotics are theoretically beneficial, but uh, the randomized control trials have not shown those benefits. So what is recommended is uh, the power downward in 5%, 2.5 to 10% is what has been tried. So what is recommended is the 5% uh, power downward in eye drops. Uh, the, the Western guideline says, one drop at least 30 seconds to 120 seconds prior to the injection is enough. But uh, for our Indian scenario where we, uh, we don't know about the hygienicity and the protocol uh, with the patient has uh, followed or not. So it's preferable that we apply at least two times. The first application when the patient is shifted to the OR, that is uh, approximately 10 minutes before the procedure. The second one is just before your uh, so you have to remember one thing, the dilocazilocin jelly can prevent the poidonaridin uh, sterilizing the uh, conductible surface. So touch the eyelids or the eyelashes uh, uh, firmly because that can give rise to baby wind discharge and it can uh, conductible fluid. So this, this should be a gentle painting of the uh, clarinexa. So what uh, according to the evidence-based medicine, we don't need to give uh, the antibiotics, pre-op antibiotics or the post-op antibiotics for these patients. But for some patients who have a higher risk of uh, uh, infection or when you are, we are not sure of the patient's hygienicity, uh, you can err on the side of uh, giving uh, pre-op pre -op antibiotics. Uh, when we need to give pre-op antibiotics, a fluoroconulone uh, is preferred, preferably a third or fourth generation. But there are studies uh, which suggest that if a patient needs a multiple injections, then it can lead to the antibiotic resistance and can give, to, uh, give rise to endophthalmitis, which can be resistant and difficult to treat. So using antibiotics, you need to be cautious. And use it only in selected patients. So another, uh, the evidence-based uh, recommendation is the most important step in reducing endophthalmitis and the most important prophylaxis using ordinary. <clears throat> so coming to the uh, procedure, so we need to, uh, what needles can be used? Any needle between 27 and 33 gauge uh, needles can be used. Smaller the gauge, lesser the force that is needed to inject and lesser the pain. Usually we uh, prefer a 30 gauge needle. We need a sterile speculum. Some studies have been conducted uh, uh, comparing the injection with and without speculum. So with speculum, the advantage is it will, it will push your uh, eyelashes away from the injection path and thereby it, it can further reduce the chances of intraocular infection. <clears throat> the, there are again studies which quote that the larger the size of the, uh, the needle, the lesser the chance of intraocular pressure increase because through the needle tract, there'll be some regurgitation of the 
which is which takes place and thereby the iop uh, gets balanced smaller the gauge the faster the uh, drug is injected higher the in, uh, incidence of intra raised intraocular pressure though it is transient coming to the injection site so most of the literature is suggest that you need to give it either infrotemporal or suprotemporal but practically it can be given 360 degree anywhere around the limbus so where do we give it uh, if it is a fake kick at 3 mm 3 mm uh, 3 mm from the uh, limbus if it is a pseudo fake kick 3.5 and if it is fake kick 4 mm from the limbus why do we need to maintain this distance from the limbus if you are further anterior you have there is a chance that you may cause a hemorrhage in the ciliary body or you may touch the lens uh, if you are a little posterior you may create a retinal break and retinal detachment so technique of injection uh, we need to instruct the patient to direct the gaze away from the site of the injection conjunctiva may be displaced anteriorly using the either the forceps or the cotton tip applicator so that the direct route between the vitreous and the ocular surface remains some authors and some studies do suggest a biplanar injection where you go uh, an angulated uh, into the sclera with some angulation and then rotate it perpendicularly and uh, inject it in the vitreous cavity the advantage is that the vitreous wick which can come and accumulate under the conjunctiva theoretically can again increase the incidence of endophthalmitis so injection should be aimed at midvitreous cavity with the bevel upward the needle is inserted perpendicular to the sclera the injection should be done slowly to avoid the jet formation or cavitary flow so this is a small video to show the intraocular injection so again as i mentioned the most important factor in decreasing the incidence of endophthalmitis is application of the the powdered and iodine uh, 5% powdered and iodine drops and then using a caliper you can mark the 3.5 this is a sort of a kick patient so 3.5 mm from the limbus then it can in sclera you can see that and slowly drag into the vitreous cavity and while we're drawing make sure that the injection site is pressed for few seconds and then it is released so these uh, steps will prevent the vitreous wake or this dental massage again decrease the intraocular pressure to some extent coming to the intraocular pressure uh, <clears throat> what happens to the intraocular pressure following the intraocular injection is a paracentesis necessary in all cases i know a few surgeons who routinely do paracentesis following the intraocular pressure in fact it used to be a, a mandatory thing a few years before but right now the recommendation is paracentesis is not necessary if you are injecting a drug volume of 0.05 ml if you are injecting more then you can take a call on doing a paracentesis do we need to see the fundus and the uh, disc pulsation in all the cases following the intraocular injections no it is not recommended what is recommended is once the injection is given if the patient complains of a drop in the vision the pre injection vision then you need to look into the eye or if uh, on the other hand if the patient uh, vision maintains the vision after the injection that means his uh, intraocular pressure is not that high to cause an arterial occlusion or a further damage so idio is inter indirect ophthalmoscopy is not needed in all cases in selective cases it can be done wherein a patient is uh, uh, has a labile eye which is very sensitive for the uh, for minor increase in the intraocular pressures so all cases where the patient has symptomatic of pain reduce vision immediately of the following injections in these patients we need to look into the eye dilated look into there <clears throat> coming to the complications uh, following the intraocular injections uh, the intraoperative can batrogen can be the lens touch the vitreous hemorrhage the retinal detachment and the end of thalmitis so according to the literature it is uh, reported somewhere between 0.019 to 0.8 percent which is in the marina study uh, so most of it it is uh, less than one in uh, 2000 injections so the other complications are it can be a drug induced drug related the retinal toxicity and the retinal necrosis the vascular shutdown 
and the inflammatory reaction, which is uh, mimicking the infection. So all these things have to be kept in mind when we give an injection. <clears throat> so sometimes we see an inflammatory reaction, uh, which is uh, the, the, the anti-VEGF of induced uh, inflammation. So the key here will be the eye will not have the uh, ominous signs of uh, circumcellary congestion. It will have more of flare. It, you can have an hypopion. We published a paper on uh, bevacizumab induced uh, inflammatory reaction. So these will not respond for intravital injections. You need to treat them with the uh, steroids and some may need a systemic steroids. So you need to differentiate whether it is the uh, inflammatory reaction or an endothelmitis and then treat it accordingly. Coming to the contraindications and special situations, any patient with a recent cerebrovascular accident or a myocardial infection uh, is better not injected for at least three months. Any patient who has a periocular infection, say blepharitis or conjunctivitis, uh, the injection needs to be postponed. The other situations like wherein the uh, patient has undergone glaucoma surgery, we need to be careful not to inject through the bleb or the scleral patch graft or the uh, implant. Uh, in certain situations like uh, post vitrectomy or silicon filled dye, we need to be cautious. Uh, or, uh, in the sense, uh, there is an evidence that post vitrectomy eyes, the drug washout is much faster and the, uh, the duration of action of the drug may not be that high. Silicon oil filled dyes, it is recommended to give half dose of the uh, usual dosage which we give in the non vitrectomized dyes. So, coming to the pregnancy and intervertical injections. In the first trimester, there is uh, some anecdotal or case reports saying that it can be teratogenic. So uh, it's better to avoid in the first trimester. Second and third, uh, the risk benefit ratio has to be assessed. By, by and large, in pregnancy, if it can be avoided, it's better. But if it is mandatory, if it has to be given, it has to be given in the third trimester. In lactating mothers, uh, it uh, the case reports are there and there is a relatively uh, enough evidence that it can be given. So coming to the anticoagulation intraortal injection, this is one thing which most of the patients uh, ask because for them, it is any intraocular procedure, they need to stop their uh, aspirin and clopidogrel. So anticoagulation discontinuation will put the patient for increased risk of thromboembolic and cerebrovascular accidents. Uh, the evidence through Mariner trial says that there is no increased risk of intraocular bleeding because we use a very fine needle. So it's not recommended to stop these anti anticoagulation uh, medication. They can continue while we go ahead and give this. Coming to the bilateral uh, injections, can we give uh, in the same setting? Again, again, there is an evidence that uh, these are tolerated well uh, in the Western literature, but uh, the AOS VRSA recommendation says, unless it is uh, dire uh, necessity, it's better to postpone these injections by at least three days apart. Uh, separate, when, 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 when we give it in a same setting, we need to make sure that the separate instruments are used for each eye. So none of the, uh, when it was given, most of the patients accepted it uh, uh, well because in Western uh, world, the logistics is uh, important. The man hours spent in the, bringing the patient to the hospital, so and so on. So you, they prefer the bilateral injections and they did not opt for unilateral injections who have received bilateral injections. The patient should be counseled for the risk and complication. Theoretically, there's a risk that the drugs can, drug can at, uh, achieve a higher uh, concentration in the blood, uh, though it's not proven in the studies. So bilateral injections, even we do give in certain subset of uh, uh, patients with retinopathy of prematurity, uh, because these are the very fragile uh, patients who come with the, um, uh, the neonatologist, uh, bring them to the hospital. And these are the eyes where we cannot do a laser so in such patients, instead of getting them twice to the hospital uh, and submitting them for the hospital, the, the, all these logistic issues, it can be given bilateral and uh, it's tolerated quite well. <clears throat> so coming to the anti-VEGF, uh, I'll just touch upon the anti-VEGFs a little bit and then go on to the preparation and whereabouts of the uh, Avastin, the bevacizumab injections. 
Uh, it started in 2004. The pegatinib was the first drug to have uh, approved to be approved for intravertebral injection. That is an aptama, followed by a bevacizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody. It was uh, mm, it start it was the start it was recommended for intravertebral usage and being continued from there. 2005, although it's an off label. 2006, ranibizumab was approved for intravertebral injection by FDA, and then the aflibercept, and now we have conversept and prolicizumabs. <clears throat> so indications, the choroidal nevascularization of any cause, be it ARMD, be it the RAP, pathological myopia, angiot streaks, best disease, CSCR, multifocal choroiditis, choroidal astioma, toxoplasmosis. So any post-inflammatory, post-myopic, or age-related choroidal nevascularization, anti vegf is now the treatment of choice. Retinal neovascularization, which can be because of the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the sickle cell retinopathy, retinopathy of prematurity or eels, macular edema, secondary to diabetic retinopathy, vein occlusions, pseudophagic, uveitic, or occlusive vasculitis. All these are indications for anti vegf And neovascular glaucoma, secondary to vein occlusions, and the diabetic retinopathy or ocular ischemic syn uh, syndromes, and also the radiation retinopathy. Uh, these are the indications for anti -VEGF. Now coming to the important topic, the uh, vivacism map, the safety measures, we need to remember that it's an off-label and uh, what the guidelines which is given by again, uh, the AOS VRS is to make sure that we don't end up in uh, trouble is, we need to procure this drug with an authorized Roche dealer. We need to Main, uh, we need to make sure that the dealer has maintained the cold chain, look into the log of the uh, ROS dealer, whether the cold chain has been maintained. And then once it is delivered to the hospital, uh, we need to make sure that we store it in the refrigerator and the temperature log of that particular uh, <clears throat> refrigerator is maintained. By doing this, uh, the drug related uh, issues can be taken care. The main difference between the ranibizumab and the bevacizumab is this. The ranibizumab comes in a single dose and we need not be bothered about the, the compounding of the drug or the drug related issues which can raise. Otherwise, the, the second part, which is the eye related or the technique related is common for both bevacizumab and ranibizumab. So the compounding that is the fractioning of the uh, uh, bevacizumab is very important. So there are three uh, main uh, ways of going about uh, fractioning this uh, BVSS map. The first one is the aliquots, which is uh, very few centers in India have this uh, uh, pharmaco, uh, pharmaco, they, they have in-house uh, uh, in -house class uh, thousand environment under a class 10 laminar flow hood, wherein you can prepare uh, small ampules, which is preferred, but not many hospitals or institutions have that. What most of us, follow is fractioning and aliquoting. We need to prepare the, we need to withdraw the drug in one uh, ml tuberculin syringes uh, in an air uh, tight environment, use a three way, uh, use a three way with a large bore needle poke into the vial and then attach the two syringes, one cc syringes, withdraw and then turn off the uh, three way needle so that the air does not contaminate. The clean room with the laminar flow hood is what is needed. Uh, if you don't have a laminar flow hood in your hospital, a sterile OT with a HEPA filter or a laminar flow with uh, air filters is uh, adequate. So these are this is the most uh, preferred way of uh, splitting in most of the hospitals. The third one is the direct use from the vial. Though it is not, uh, there are no studies which recommend the usage of that. It can be used cautiously. What is most important is before we use the uh, that particular oil for any injection, we need to make sure that one sample of 0.02 ml is withdrawn, 0.2 ml is withdrawn from the oil and sent for lab examination for staining and culture sensitivity. So by 48 hours, you get the report. And once you are sure that you have sterile, you, may, you need to make sure that you attach that lab report into your file and then go ahead and use the drug. Uh, coming to the steroids, we have transcendone, dexamethasone implant, and fluorescinolone. 
Uh, indications will be diabetic macular edema, macular edema secondary to vein occlusions, pseudophagic CME, non-infectious vitreitis, and certain cases of EMD, which are uh, resistant to uh, intraortal anti-VHFs. It can be combined with that. The steroids have an issue of intraocular pressure and cataract. Uh, I'll not touch upon that. Coming to the last part of my talk, the antibiotics, intraortal antibiotics, one of the uh, key reasons why intraortal injection became uh, more famous is the need to treat the endophthalmitis patients. So you don't have to memorize these drug concentrations and how to prepare. So every theater should have uh, a poster or the, the, the drug dosage and the method of preparation pasted on the wall because you know when you need it. And when you need it, your paramedic should be able to prepare that uh, the, the, the drug in the required dosage looking at the, uh, the chart. So this is a small video to show how the antibiotics are prepared. So you can see that here we have uh, the vancomycin ceftazidim, which is empirically used. You don't have to give this intraortal uh, inj antibiotic injections in the operation theta. It can be given in your OPD. You need to make sure that you have a sterile cloth or the gloves cover, you can use that as a sterile uh, spread over the table. You can withdraw, you can, you need to scrub, wash your hands and then wear a gloves. Inject the saline as recommended by the manufacturer into the, the vancomycin powder. And then you, we need to shake it vigorously to make sure that the drug gets dissolved well. And we need to make sure that the date is mentioned on it. Usually it is recommended to use a fresh well for every case. But sometimes uh, these drugs can be used for up to one week and not more than that. Again, this is how you prepare the dilution technique. You need to make sure that you withdraw the drug, use an air bubble and make sure that it moves the up and down thereby allowing enough mixing of the drug. So this is important because every uh, surgeon in order to be a VR surgeon, every inter-segment surgeon should be aware of giving intraortal injections because any endophthalmitis, that the time is key. Every hour, every day is important. So before referring it to a VR surgeon, you can go ahead and give an intraortal injection in your OPD, if not uh, OT, make, making sure that you have a sterile, taking all sterile precautions and You prepare all these things and keep it ready. This is the dexamethasone and it can be administered into the vitreous cavity. So this is uh, another video to show how uh, the we take a vitreous tap, you make a, uh, a single port entry into the vitreous cavity. Uh, uh, so 25, 25 gauge probe, which I'm using, vitrectomy. So it is connected to the 2cc, 5cc syringe. And the paramedic, the assisting paramedic aspirates the, the vitreous sample. As you can see, there's an enough sample which gets collected in this. So this is how you collect the vitreous cavity. Uh, sample and then through the same port you can inject the intraarterial drugs. Um, so endophthalmitis following vitrectomy is not uh, very rare. We do come across the endophthalmitis and this is one such case where uh, following an uh, uh, following a injection of Ozodex we had an uh, endophthalmitis three days post op. So this is I'm just showing a small video just to uh, make you all alert that intra, though intraarterial uh, injection of uh, steroid or the anti which is a very safe procedure, but you need to be keep in your mind that if an endophthalmitis occurs, you need to diagnose it and manage it uh, timely. So you can see that the PVD is being induced. So this is just 
for three days post op, and you can see that the endosome matrix is set in, and it has caused a lot of retinal hemorrhages, and well, to some extent, there is some retinal necrosis. And this is the Ozodex drug implant, which is uh, very hard. So we had a tough time in removing this. I had to break it into two using the cutter. And then we had to railroad it into the uh, flute needle, that is the extrude needle, and bring it out through the 23 gauge cutter, as you can see this. So what is important is uh, to understand that the pentravital uh, injections can lead to uh, the complications. We need to keep those in mind. So when do we follow up these patients? What is recommended is uh, we need to see them within five days of injection for medical legal purpose and also to make sure that we don't miss out on the opportunity to pick up this endophthalmitis or a raised IOP which can happen or any atrogenic uh, issues which could have been caused. So the recommendation is between three to five days, we need to see them once. For some reason, if the patient is not able to uh, uh, come for a follow -up for the follow-up visit, we need, we, we need to have a mechanism wherein we can call up the patient and make sure that he is not uh, experiencing uh, undue pain or redness or a drop in the vision. And we need to document that in the case sheet that the patient has been called and the, uh, the, his well-being is taken care. So otherwise it is uh, mandatory that we need to see them within three to five days because that is the time which is, uh, that is the time window wherein the endosthelial matrix, if it all sets in, it will be early and we can treat it. Most of the times endosthelial matrix following the, uh, following the intraoral injection is mild to moderate. It is not very severe. Having said that, we have seen uh, severe uh, endosthelmitis also, but compared to the those which are following the trabeculectomies or cataract surgeries, these are relatively mild. The endosthelmitis following these injections are attributed to two things. One is, as I men mentioned, the drug itself. That is where there are concerns regarding the uh, usage of Avastin. So if you take uh, precautions in procuring the drug from the uh, known dealer, or recommended uh, dealer by uh, by the Roche, recommended by Roche, you should be safe. The other uh, issue will be the conjunctival flora, which can be taken care by the, the proper uh, cleaning of the eye and maintaining the, the powder uh, drop, which needs to be instilled to sterilize the conjunctiva. The other most, one more thing which we need to remember is there have been uh, reports of the uh, endosthelm that is caused by the the droplet infection from the surgeon. So it is mandatory that the surgeon should be using the mask and he should not speak, avoid speaking while giving the injection. He, neither the doctor nor the assistant who is standing the next or the patient, none of these patients should be talking while giving the injections because the most common organism which is isolated uh, following the intraoral injection is the step, the gram positive cocci, which is uh, found in the, or the uh, oral flora of the uh, normal human beings. So with this, I will uh, end my talk. So I will take any more, any questions. Dr. Madhu, hi, Dr. Saptagiri is here. Yes, sir. It's been a wonderful talk, uh, quite extensive. Sir. Uh, covering mostly for the basics and also a little advanced. I'm definitely sure it's going to be very helpful for all the DNB students and also the fellows. Uh, that said and done, there have been a lot of questions actually which have come up. Yes, sir. Uh, I think you can see them or shall I read them out to you? Uh, always see that, sir. Uh, I'll just start with the first question and then you can start seeing them. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Madhuri Shivaram has been asking uh, post intravitreal anti VEGF injections. Yes, how sir. long do you continue antibiotic eye drops? Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the recommendation is that you don't have to give a pre or post operative uh, antibiotics but in certain patients like in in our setup where i practice in guntur we are not sure of patients complaints with whether they maintain the ocular hygiene or sometimes we, we advise injection on that particular day they come after 15 days 
they don't uh, stick to the instructions which are given so what we follow is on that particular day if usually two to three days before and three days after the injection is what is uh, given sometimes the patient comes on that particular day and he wants injection on that day itself so on that day we can give a pulse therapy like every half an hour we can give, give uh, one drop of antibiotic injection uh, drop and then inject following the injection four times a day for three days is adequate and do you have any preference for any antibiotic uh yes the fluoroquine alone i usually prefer uh, plain oflacin because again as i mentioned there are studies which say like if you use a third or fourth uh, uh um, fourth group of fluoroquine loans uh, especially in the patients who have repeated who need repeated injections you keep on using these drops and they may uh, develop the resistance to those antibiotics and if they develop an end of thalamitis it will be difficult to treat with the hair antibiotics so i prefer the oflacin uh, plain oflacin for 3 days before and 3 days after when it is needed in certain sub group of patients the next question is by dr ram kumar he is asking what is the indication for anti vegf in pseudo tumor cerebri i think it's he's referring to maybe uh, iv anti anti vegf is it or is um it? no sir he's uh, in in pseudo tumor cerebri again it is not uh, the for the pseudo pseudo tumor cerebri uh, itself it is the changes which it causes the pseudo tumor cerebri can lead to the changes inside the eye like for uh, disc edema wherein which can uh, lead to a secondary vein occlusion uh, and then the cystic macular edema so anti vegfs can work in two ways one is it can decongest the disc the disc edema will come down thereby the compartment syndrome is taken care of the other thing if the patient has uh, uh, macular edema again the anti vegf will take care of it um. There's a question from Dr. Yash. Yes, sir. He's asking when you have to give three intravitreal injections with yes, different sir. antibiotics for endophthalmitis. What yes, are the sir. guidelines to give the injection? And is it using the same needle at same site and changing the injection, or using three different needles at different site close to each other? Okay. Uh, so the there are two ways of doing it. usually if you use uh, the same needle that is also a, uh, one of the ways to go about it but the problem is patient has to be very uh, cooperative and if the patient is you are giving it under the block this particular technique will work you can keep the uh, the injection the needle there and hold the injection at the hub and withdraw the syringe and then use the, the just use the different syringes to inject through the same needle the other way of doing it is if the patient is not uh, on on topical if you are giving you can give a, use the three different syringes with three diff, uh, three thirtigate needles uh, in the same uh, uh, site you can use it you need not prick it in a different uh, sites you can use it in the same site okay there's a question And, from dr rahul yes, uh, he is asking in case of cataract surgery following intravitreal injection in the same sitting Yes, sir. Prior to intravitreal injection, the anterior chamber should be softer than routine post-op cataract surgery. Um, see, again, it depends on the surgeon's choice. Uh, if the same surgeon is giving the intravitreal uh, injection, uh, the you you need to give the uh, keep the eye uh, slightly firm because if the eye is soft, then the needle the, the you you need to use more pressure to push the needle inside. Thereby, you are deforming the sclera. and your tunnel will open up or the anterior chamber will leak so it should be not too hard it should be just about firm you inject the uh, intraocular injection and after that you feel for the intraocular pressure if you feel like it is slightly high you can always uh, allow some amount of the fluid in the anterior chamber to egress so um, that is you you just need to titrate there's been a uh... from dr kamala mahesh sure. is asking that labeling of multiple syringes is a good practice which can be encouraged yes sir and dr ram kumar has something to add he thinks uh, paracentesis is not needed he feels that 
in cases where it may be needed is like an NVG. I just wanted to know your comments. Uh, yes, sir. I mentioned that's what uh, the recommendation has been like. Uh, uh, I, as I mentioned, I know of surgeons uh, who are my colleagues. They routinely do paracentesis for after for all, all intraoral injections. But the recommendation has been the paracentesis is not needed. It's an uh, unnecessary introduction of a another instrument into the antechamber because there, there are uh, n number of studies which have shown that 0 0.05 ml of the drug is very well tolerated inside the eye. Having said that, a patient who has uh, uh, NVG where the, the already the intraocular pressures will be somewhere around 40 to 50 and patients who have uh, the advanced cupping, the 0 0.8, 0 0.9 cupping, even a transient raise in the pressure can be deleterious on those eyes. So in such patients, uh, we need to do paracentesis. And that's what we do. That's where I mentioned like we need to have a very good preoperative evaluation, look at the disc and see the patients who have uh, impending vein occlusion, where uh, a raise in the intraocular pressure can give rise to a full-blown um, vein occlusion. So certain uh, eyes where the surgeon feels that the transient raise in the intraocular pressure can be uh, problematic. In such patients, we can do a paracentesis. Otherwise, routinely, it's not needed. Okay. Uh, there's been some questions from the YouTube channel. Uh, Dr. Apnur Ramcharan is asking, some textbooks uh, suggest not to dilate the pupils so as to observe the reactions during intravitreal injection. Dilatation, is it necessary or can we give injection undilated? Uh, yes, sir. So usually we don't dilate. Uh, for the intraoral injection, that's not a recommendation. But yes, in, during the learning uh, process, the beginners, uh, it is recommended that they dilate the pupil and give the injections because they need to see the tip in the vitreous cavity and then inject to see that the, the gush of the fluid going. So, so just to get oriented about the needle and the dynamics of the, the, the movement of the needle, so in the beginning phase, we recommend for our fellows and the DNB students who give intraoral injection to dilate, look for the tip in the vitreous cavity and then give. Otherwise, uh, it's not recommended. Dilatation is not necessary. Uh, there's another question by Dr. Rohit Menke. He's asking after allocating, for how long can we use bevacizumab injection from same preparation? Uh, what the AOS VRSI guidelines says is uh, for bevacizumab is one month. But what we follow at Shankara is 15 days. So up to one month, it can be used. Sir. Provided okay. you have, you maintain that cold chain, you need to have that uh, the double uh, self-sealing Ziploc bags stacked in a sterile uh, airtight container. And when you are uh, taking out the truck, you need to make sure that you use a sterile forcep and withdraw only one particular uh, the Ziploc bag and open it and use. You need to make sure that the place where you, you are using this, uh, you're opening this uh, airtight container is in the uh, uh, laminar flow or in an OT. Don't open it in the other places, dirty corridors or in your storage place. So if you follow these stringent norms, sterility norms, you can use it for 15 days to one month, not beyond one month. And Dr. Devashish is asking a uh, pseudophagic patient with treatment knife DME with no features of glaucoma, would you prefer Ozodex or anti vegf And so no come again, sir? on OCT. Uh, okay, it's, a come again, it's a pseudophagic patient. Yes, sir. With treatment knife DME. Yes, sir. Features of glaucoma. Would you mm -hmm. prefer Ozodex or anti vegf uh, as the glaucometer side, definitely we will prefer anti of first. No, he's saying if it's a treatment name with no features of glaucoma. Okay, with no features of glaucoma. Okay, sir. Yes. So again, uh, if, if if you are looking at a treatment nave eye following the cataract surgery, uh, if uh, two things here we need to look into, is it a pseudophagic CME, or is it a DME, or it's a mix of both. So here a good clinical examination is very important. One, preoperatively, we should have picked it up if the cataract is so dense or for some reason we have not picked it up. Then postoperatively, there are certain signs to tell whether it is a DME or a CME or a mix of both. If there are visible microaneurysms or there are hemorrhages which attribute towards the diabetic uh, cause for the macular edema, then 
uh, we we need to treat it in terms of uh, the protocol for uh, the diabetic macroedema treatment. If there are no microorganisms, if there are no signs to suggest that it can be because of diabetic macroedema, then it's likely that it will be because of pseudophagia. So in such patients, first I would prefer giving them a topical NSAID along with the steroid. If that doesn't uh, bring down the uh, system, the macular edema, then I will prefer uh, the, if it is a pseudophagic, purely pseudophagic, then I would prefer steroid, that is dexamethasone implant. If there is an element of diabetic uh, macular edema, say there are microorganisms, and then I would prefer a monthly anti vegf as a uh, treatment because in a pseudophagic uh, macular edema, the inflammation is the uh, primary culprit. Whereas in diabetic macular edema, it's not one-off thing. And giving an intrauteral uh, uh, anti vegf has advan uh, another advantage that it will uh, uh, pre-phone the changes of the diabetic retropathy. In the sense, if the patient has a severe NPDR, then that gets a little pre-graded pre into moderate NPDR. That's an added event, advantage. So I would prefer near treatment nav I if it is a diabetic macular edema, I would prefer anti -vegif. If it is pseudophagic predominantly, uh, it's inflammation, I would prefer dexamethasone implant. Uh, Dr. Rahila is asking, uh, what are the recommendations for the use of anti-glaucoma medications post-injection? Uh, post injection, uh, it's there is no, uh, no particular guidelines as such. Patient can start using the uh, uh, the anti glaucoma medication from the day of the intraoral injection itself. They can continue uh, or whatever medication they have been using. If the patient ends up in a higher intraocular pressure because of uh, the uh, injection itself, then we need to again uh, start uh, controlling that with the medical line of management. Initially, we give for four to five days, we give the systemic, that is the estazolamide. And once that uh, acute phase of controlling is over, then we try to manage it with the, uh, the topical anti-glaucoma medications. Otherwise, if the patient who is a known glaucoma patient or has been using AGMs, there is no specific uh, recommendation, they can continue the medications. I think that also answers the next question by Dr. Sonali, who's asking similar lines, so, that in glaucomatous patients, is it advisable to give pre-op diamox before the injection? Uh, not necessarily, question. not necessarily. Pro uh, again, uh, if it's a glaucomatous patient, that you need to set the target pressure and the patient is, if he's under the treatment, that means his pressures are in the acceptable range. So in such patients, you don't have to give a diamox uh, or uh, uh, other uh, IOP lowering agents uh, before. But in, in these patients, the follow-up needs to be a little more meticulous. You need to see them a little more often, say uh, once in three to five days, then at say between one, uh, two weeks, uh, two weeks once, and then at one month. You don't want to lose out on the time. Uh, you don't want that eye to have higher pressure for longer time. That's the only thing. You need to change the follow-up a little bit. Uh, Dr. Preeti Shandar is asking, is it recommended in pediatric cases of endophthalmitis? Pediatric case of endophthalmitis, the intravertical antibiotics? Antibiotics, yes. Okay, yeah, see, uh, the, the, the treatment of endophthalmitis as such, uh, what has been given by the EVS study is mainly for post-cataract surgeries. And that does not hold good for the trauma cases or the intraoral injections are the pediatric cases. So we need to see this, uh, we need to uh, decide case by case. If the patient is not showing advanced changes of endothelmitis, the vision is still uh, better than corner finger one meter and uh, the anterior segment is relatively clear, we can still try intraoral antibiotics. What it does is most of these patients need a surgery under general anesthesia. So, for some with some difficulty, you can give either under short GA or topical, you can give an intraoral injection. It will buy you a time. Even in cases where uh, uh, the vitrectomy is needed, we can, in some uh, patients, we can give intraoral injection and then do that. Otherwise, the protocol remains same. If it can be treated with intraoral injections, yes, it can be given. Uh, Dr. Rome wants to ask that uh, while answering to the previous question asked by Dr. Yash, 
you mentioned that uh, we can give more than one intravitreal injection by keeping same needle in the place. So, so he feels that by doing this, aren't we injecting few amount of the same drug used previously, which is remaining in the needle? Um, that is there, but what is the amount of uh, drug which remains in the needle? That is, we need to inject 0.1 ml of the drug into the vitreous cavity. What remains in the needle is probably 0.01 or 0.02, not more than that. So it can be given. That, not, that will not be a, a major uh, concern. Like as I mentioned, uh, the, these are the uh, drugs which have to be given intravitreally. And when we give three drugs intravitreally, we need to do paracentesis also. And another concern will be the precipitation where the, if we mix vanco with septicidin, we see the white precipitation which happens. That anyways eventually happens inside the eye. That is not shown to be a delta to the eye. Uh, there's a comment from Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam. So uh, sir has been commenting that anti-glaucoma medications may delay the drug influx from the vitreous, uh, hence may prolong the duration of action of the drug. There is some evidence for this thought. Sir. And that this is only in a non-glaucoma patient that the drugs that decrease aqueous production are to be used for this, not okay, ones sir. that facilitate the outflow. Okay, sir. Uh, I think we've almost come to the end of the session. Uh, it's been wonderful and also wonderful to note uh, comments from uh, colleagues and senior uh, uh, consultants. Uh, before I close, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Madhu. It's been a wonderful session. And uh, tomorrow's session is going to be taken by Dr. Pradeep Sagar, who's a retina consultant at uh, Shankarai Hospital, Shimoga. Uh, he'll be taking a session on uh, OCT, its interpretation and clinical situations. The time remains the same. It's from 12 o'clock to 1 p.m. And I hope you'll have a wonderful time. Thank you, Dr. Madhu. Thank and you, thank sir. You Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you all.